Good day, Grade 11 learners of South Africa. Welcome to Mindset. And today we're working through circulation, or commonly known as transport. We've done transport system in plants. We're now going to look at the transport system in us, in mammals. But before we do, we have to look at all the different reasons for transport and all the different types of transport systems we have in animals versus plants. So if you look at the screen here, we've got transport system part one because there are two parts. So we say all living cells require nutrients and oxygen to survive. Now, cells also produce metabolic waste. And the fact that they produce metabolic waste, we're looking at carbon dioxide, we're looking at urea, and they're all creatinine, and we can go through a whole series of all the wastes that you are going to learn about when we go through the kidney and excretion. But for now, just oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now, oxygen into the cells, carbon dioxide must be moved away. Now, circulation takes place as follows. In unicellular organisms, we have pure diffusion. So if we have, for example, little amoeba, that's a single cell that's got a cell membrane, okay, and so a little nucleus and all the other goody magics that are inside this little cell. If it needed oxygen, the oxygen would simply diffuse into the cell and it would be metabolized by, this, by the mitochondria and then out would come carbon dioxide. Just pure, simple diffusion from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. All right, now you get the silenterates and that would be like hydra, for example. Now, you're going to be doing hydra later on this year, but just to give you an idea, um, if we look at hydra, it's sort of got this type of structure. It's actually quite a sweet little organism, um, and it's got all these tentacles that sort of stick up, and in the middle here, it's got a mouth, and then this mouth leads into a cavity, so it's only diploblastic. It's got two... Um, cell membranes. Okay, so it is multicellular. It's got its tentacles, but it only has one opening called the hypostome. And this opening allows stuff in here and it gets shot out. So any nutrients, food and oxygen will come in and the wastes will just simply be squished out of this structure called the solenteron. Okay, so it's the central gastrovascular cavity, only one opening though. So everything goes into the one opening and out to the one opening. Then we have the sulomates. Now sulomates, you're looking at, for example, let me just put your e.g. hydra. And your sulomates, uh, uh, we're looking at, for example, earthworms. Okay, they have a vascular system and a very simple heart. So they have a closed blood system and the blood flows along in the one direction and back in the other, at the bottom in the other direction. And there's a little heart that pumps it. So it's a very, very basic circulatory system. Then we have arthropods. Now arthropods and mollusks. Mollusks, clearly your snail type family. And arthropods would be your insects, um, and spiders, etc., etc. All right. Now they have a cavity called a hemocell, and that hemocell is filled with blood and it bathes the organs. So you've literally got this cavity in which the organs are, are situated, and around it you've got this fluid in the hemocell, and that bathes the organs. And in that hemocell fluid, you're going to have nutrients and like glucose, for example, you're going to have oxygen, and you're going to have carbon dioxide and waste diffusing out into the hemocell and then out of the body. Um, we then have vertebrates, and the vertebrates, we have a complex circulatory system. Remember, vertebrates would be your birds, um, fish, uh, reptiles, uh, what am I missing? Fish, fish, reptiles, amphibians, which are your froggy type things, and um, birds, and then clearly mammals. So we have a circulatory system which has blood, 
and it has blood vessels and of course the heart, the heart to pump everything around the body. You must know the difference between an open and a closed circulatory system. Now an open circulatory system would be Okay, it's found mostly in arthropods and mollusks. That's where the blood is pumped into, into an aorta, which branches into a number of arteries, and then into an open series of spaces, and then it collects everything in the hemocell. So that would be a very, very big difference. Whereas with, with a closed system, um, echinoderms would be your starfish, okay? Annelids would be earthworms and vertebrates, well, your fish, your frogs, your reptiles, us, birds. Okay, blood, blood is pumped into an aorta as well, which branches into a number of blood vessels. Okay, and the blood remains in those blood vessels, and that's the most important part, people, is that the blood remains in the blood vessels, whereas here it goes into a cavity called the hemocell. So that's the biggest difference between an open and a closed blood supply. Open, Blood vessels flow into a hemocell and then away from a hemocell. Whereas with us, with a closed blood system, the blood stays in those blood vessels at all times. Blood never, ever, ever leaves the blood vessels. Okay, here blood would be under low pressure and it moves slowly. And here it's under great pressure and it moves fast. Um, blood flows back to the heart through open-ended veins. Now open-ended if you think of, you know those gloves that, you, uh, that um, some moms use in the kitchen? Um, the, you normally get the yellow or green, and you cut the ends off those fingers. That glove is what the open-ended vessels will look like. They're completely open at the end, all right? Whereas blood here flows in the blood vessels to and from the heart. Um, its distribution to the tissue is poorly controlled because you've just got this open-ended structure with this fluid that flows into this cavity. So it's not controlled at all. Whereas if we look at our blood system, it's very controlled and it can be adjusted to suit where our body needs it. For example, if you are an athlete, um, let's say you're cycling and you are a cyclist and you're sitting on your bike and you are pedaling and you are pedaling, where do you need most of the oxygen and most of the energy to be produced. Okay, you need more oxygen to your legs and you need more energy in your leg muscles. So that is where your body will take the extra glucose and the extra oxygen to make more energy. Your body knows where it needs it. And that is more controlled in a closed blood system. So it's controlled and it can be adjusted based on what is required. Whereas here, it just sort of swishes around the organs and yeah, well, if it's, if it's good, if it's bad, it's just all around the organs and diffusion just takes place in and out. Okay, blood vessels carry blood from the heart to the hemocell and it seeps now look at that, it seeps from the hemocell back into the veins, which are also just open-ended. And here, the only entry and exit through the system is through the walls of the blood vessels. Okay, so those are your arteries, your arterioles, your capillaries, your venules, and your veins. Um, just to show you here, with a closed system, you're going to have always, you have the heart, okay? And then you're going to have arteries will pump the blood away from the heart. Then the arteries split up into arterioles. So the I-O-L-E-S means baby. And then that goes into little capillary networks. And capillaries are tiny. Okay, let's just choose another color here. And then... The other end of your capillary network is where the deoxygenated blood and the wastes will now start to collect, and they will then flow into venules, and the venules flow into a vein, which is a big thing, and the vein then flows back into the heart. So think of an artery as a main road, like a highway. It's the left side of the highway, and a vein would be the right side of the highway. They're like two main highways. Now, if I want to go to visit somebody who lives in a suburb, I need to take the off-ramp, okay? Here's my off-ramp. 
and I go into an arterial, which would be main streets, which would then get smaller, until I get the streets that are around where the houses are. That would be like the capillaries. Then all the little capillaries join up again, and I then drive on the other side of the highway. So that's how you need to picture a closed circulatory system, and that is important. Now, if I was setting an exam paper, I would ask you for three differences between a closed and an open blood supply system. I'd ask you to tabulate, which means it would count seven marks because you get one mark for drawing the table and writing open and closed. All right, remember, only always compare the same thing. So if you say it's under high, low pressure, it must be under high pressure because you're talking about pressure. It is a closed system or, or, or the, the, the blood vessels are closed, the blood vessels are open. So blood only flows in blood vessels, blood doesn't flow in blood vessels. And make sure that you compare apples with apples. Okay, if we look at the human circulatory system, Okay, people, now all mammals have a closed blood circulatory system. Okay, why? Because the blood always flows inside blood vessels. It's closed. It doesn't just come out. If your blood comes out, there is a big problem. Okay, like, for example, people who are hemophiliacs. Um, when they bump themselves and the blood vessels break, it just carries on bleeding because there is no coagulant. They don't, aren't able to clot their blood. All right, we are. If you are not a hemophiliac, you can clot your own blood. Why? Because in the blood, we've got special little things called platelets that will actually block the hole. All right, we don't want blood to flow outside the blood vessels. Okay, a double circulatory system is what we have. Now, why? Because the blood passes through the heart twice. And this is something you have to know. It's a double circulatory system because the blood passes through the heart once, then it passes through the heart a second time. Now, the first time it passes through the heart, we have pulmonary circulation. Anything to do with pulmonary means the lungs. Okay, the lungs, bronchial is the blood that takes, uh, um, the, the, vein, or the veins and the arteries that takes blood to the lungs so the lungs can do their job. But the lungs work, their job is to work with the blood in, from the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins. So the blood is pumped from the heart to the lungs to oxygenate the blood and then back to the heart. And I'm going to show you what I mean in a minute. Then we have systemic circulation. Now the word systemic comes from system or systems. Now if you recall in grade three and then a again a grade six and a grade seven and eight and nine and now in 10 again, we have cells. Lots of little cells make up tissue. Lots of tissues make up an organ. Lots of organs make up a system. So for example, um, you will have the digestive system. So the digestive system will have the mouth and it'll have the stomach and the pancreas and the small intestine and the large intestine. All of that will form part of the digestive system. We've got the nervous system, which is all our nerves and the brain and the spinal cord, as well as our autonomic nervous system, which works all the smooth muscle. And you've learned all of this as you've gone through it from grade 10 and grade 11, so far anyway. So people, you've got to remember, here we're talking about systems. Now we've got to get blood to all the systems in the body. And how do we do this? We do it via the heart. So we've got two circulatory systems. It's a double circulatory system. Pulmonary circulation, pumping blood to the lungs. Why? So we can put in oxygen and we can take out the carbon dioxide, all right? And then systemic circulation to all the systems of the body so that everything can get oxygen and nutrients, okay? Here is a, a very simple colored diagram to show you. You've got blood coming in to the blue side of the heart and you've got blood going out via the red side of the heart. Now the blood that's in the red is going to be oxygenated blood and the blood in the blue it, or, or what's colored in blue here is deoxygenated blood. Now think about it. We have to, if we've got, there's the heart. OK, 
Okay, and here are the lungs in your body. All right, I'm going to use, <laughs> my colors here are going to be strange, but I'm going to use white for oxygenated. So I need to get blood to the heart. Okay, this will be from the head. And this blood coming in here is going to be from everywhere below the heart. Okay, so everything below the heart is going to be coming up into this blood vessel and everything from above is going to be going into that blood vessel. Now that goes into the heart. This blood has no oxygen, but it does have nutrients. All right, because it's coming from the digestive system as well. So it's got no oxygen. This blood must now go where? It can't go to the rest of the body. So your logic should tell you, well, where are we going to get oxygen from? From the lungs. So this blood must now be pumped to the lungs. Okay, now remember, it's still got no oxygen in it. It is full of CO2. Lots of CO2. Okay, now what is the lungs job? The lungs say, so, hold on guys, you know what? We are going to take the oxygen out of the air that we're inhaling and put it into the blood and we're going to take the carbon dioxide from the blood out and we're going to put it into the cavities in the alveoli so we can exhale the carbon dioxide. So that's the lungs job. So we're going to now take the oxygen um, put oxygen in and we're going to take the CO2 out. So CO2 is exhaled. But remember, we have now inhaled, let's go green. Ugh. Imagine green blood. Um, now we've exhaled the carbon dioxide, but we have inhaled oxygen. So now the oxygen that's now sitting here in the lungs is going to go into the blood vessels and it now has to enter the heart. But now the, this side of the heart, the right side of the heart, and this is the left side, the right side of the heart is busy with deoxygenated blood, blood that has no oxygen but lots of carbon dioxide. So this blood now can't go into the right side, it's got to go into the left side of the lungs, I mean of the heart. So it goes into the left side, and it goes down and then it gets pumped here to all the parts of the body and that is the aorta. That's our main artery. Okay, that's our main artery and that is now going to pump the blood to um, the heart tissue because the heart tissue needs blood Okay, and it's going to pump blood to um, the digestive system. And it's going to pump blood to um, the kidneys. And it's going to blood, pump blood to the legs. And etc. etc. And all this blood is now going to be pumped to all these different organs. And then it's all going to join up again as it goes through the organ, and I'm doing this very, very simply, it's going, to, it's going to split into arterioles and then to capillaries. We're going to have all our little capillary networks, and they're going to all join up to form venules, which will eventually then go back to the heart. And that part here is systemic circulation. This part here is pulmonary circulation. So the blood moving between the heart and the lungs is pulmonary circulation. The blood moving from the heart to all the parts of the body is systemic circulation. So the blood will go into the heart to the lungs, back to the heart to all the parts of the body, into the heart to the lungs, back to the heart to all the parts of the body. And that is your double circulation. So people, it literally does a figure eight. If that's the heart, the blood goes from the heart to the lungs, from the lungs, uh, from the heart to all the parts of the body, to the lungs, to all the parts of the body, to the lungs, to all the parts of the body. And every time it's going to go through the heart. And that is your double 
circulation. Okay, so going back to our little colored diagram here, and let's get a nice bright color. I'm going to use bright green. So here, your blood is coming in. This is deoxygenated, and you're not going to see that. Let's get another color here. Um, let's see if pink will work. We have deoxygenated blood, so we're going to put an X through it. It's deoxygenated. It's come from all the parts of the body. That must now be pumped from the heart, from this area, into this ventricle, and up, and there it is going to the lungs. And because it is moving away from the heart, it is called an artery. All right? Then the lungs will put oxygen in the blood, and the oxygen will come from the lungs, and it's then going to go into the heart and be pumped to all the parts of the heart, uh, I mean all the parts of the body via systemic circulation. And this blood, because it's coming from uh, um, the lungs to the heart, it's called a vein. Okay, now that's something else you have to remember. What the, the, the names of the vessels, so arteries versus veins, okay, is not based on whether it carries oxygenated blood or deoxygenated blood. It's based on whether it's entering or leaving the heart. So what you must remember is that, I'm going to just write it on here. If it enters, okay, let's do it this way. If it leaves the heart, it is moving away from the heart. And if it moves away from the heart, it starts with an A, an A4 artery. So it doesn't matter if it's carrying oxygen or not. It's moving away from the heart. Now remember we have double circulation. So a blood vessel that moves away from the heart and takes the blood from the heart to the lungs, it's moving away from the heart. It's, it will be called the pulmonary artery, all right? And the pulmonary artery is taking deoxygenated blood. It's moving away from the heart, deoxygenated blood to the lungs. Now, the lungs put oxygen in. So now the blood is oxygenated. Now, if we look back here, that oxygenated blood is now going to move into the heart. And because it's entering the heart, if it enters the heart, then it is a vein. If it moves away from the heart, it is an artery. So it doesn't matter what, whether it's carrying oxygenated blood or deoxygenated blood. If it's pulmonary artery, it's carrying blood away from the heart, but it's deoxygenated. Pulmonary vein is bringing oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart. So just remember, if it enters, it's a vein. If it moves away from the heart, the A for away and the A for artery. And then you will never, ever get it wrong. Now, what I've got here is a diagram to show you systemic circulation. And this, you're going to look and you're like, whoa, for heaven's sake, how are we ever going to learn this? Um, this is what was in the old syllabus. This is what you would have had to learn in grade 10 in the old syllabus. Now, you just have to know the basic structure. The reason I put this diagram in, because I wanted you to see all the red. Now, the blood will come from the lungs into the heart via the pulmonary vein. That blood will now be pumped via the aorta to all the parts of the body, okay? It pumps this way, and the aorta is going to pump to the arms and to the brain and also the heart tissue. Now, this is something you must understand. Okay, um, if you have a butcher, all right, you know a butcher who works in a place where they, they cut up meat and where you can buy meat? That's a butcher. Now, a butcher um, works with meat. All right, you agree with me? But... That butcher, even though he works with meat all day, he's there chopping up meat. He's chopping up a, a carcass of a calf and a, and a sheep and a, a lamb and a pig, and he's chopping up all this, all this meat. That's his job, okay? So he works with meat. That's his job. But the butcher must 
also eat. If he doesn't eat, he's not going to be able to have the energy to do his job. You follow? So the fact that he must eat, he's going to need nutrients and he's also going to need oxygen. Why? So that he can make ATP, he can make energy. We can look at a baker. All right, and I know I'm laboring this, but I need for you to understand. A baker is going to work with bread all day, bread and cakes. Okay, that's his job. But he, he's, when he's busy kneading the dough and making um, beautiful cakes and all the rest of it, that, that's not osmosing into his body or diffusing into his body. He still has to sit down and he has to eat and he needs oxygen so that he can have ATP, he can have energy. And how does he get that? And how do these guys get that? So what we do is we look at the body and we say, right, if we divide certain organs, we've got organs in our body that work with blood. And we, we tend to think that because they work with blood, we forget that they actually need a blood supply themselves. Okay, so if we look at um, the organ, so this is going to be whatever the organ is, this is going to be its job. Okay, the blood vessels that help it to do its job. And this is going to be the blood vessels that it needs to survive. So this is its job and this is to survive. So this is for nutrients and oxygen. Okay. Blood vessels for its job. And we need blood vessels to survive. Okay. So if we look at the heart... The heart is going to be organ number one. So here we have the heart. And the heart is blood vessels that it works with. It's going to work with the aorta, okay, which is going to take blood to all the parts of the body because it's the main artery. And we're going to work with the superior and inferior venae. Cave. Okay, that is your superior, in, superior always means above, inferior is below. So the superior vena means vein, cave means main. So it's telling you the main vein bringing blood from below the heart is the inferior, it's below, vena cave, and blood from the top is going to be the superior it's above, it's superior, superior vena, vein, cave, main. So it's the main vein from the top, main vein from the bottom. Okay, so that's bringing all the blood from systemic circulation and aorta is going to take blood to all the parts of the body. But the heart, what, what is it? That's its job. But the blood vessels to survive, the, the heart is going to have the coronary artery and that's going to bring oxygen and nutrients to the heart, the actual muscle of the heart, so it can do its job. And we're going to have the coronary vein, which is going to take the carbon dioxide and the wastes away from the heart. So branching from the aorta, you are going to have the coronary artery and the coronary vein. I'm going to show all of that to you just now. I've got a little model here. Okay. Along the same process, and these are structures you have to know through your course of your year, we're going to have the heart. If we look at the kidneys, the kidneys are very special. This is like a chef that eats on the job. The kidneys the sh is going to have the renal artery and the renal vein, okay? And taking blood back, you're going to have the renal artery and the renal vein. So what's going to happen here is the kidneys are going to use a little bit of the glucose and the oxygen and they're going to put back carbon dioxide and wastes, very little wastes, but mainly carbon dioxide in that renal vein. Why? Because the wastes have been filtered out. Okay, so less wastes are going to be passed back 
and here it's going to have you're going to have oxygen and nutrients all right now if we look at the liver and the liver you must know this is quite important so in the liver we have now this is the blood the liver works with and it works with the hepatic portal vein okay now portal is the same as double circulation it means that there are two sets of capillaries that have happened here the first set of capillaries is going to be in the digestive system and the second set of capillaries is going to be inside the liver so you've got the hepatic portal vein and what's that what that vein is doing is it brings all the nutrients collected or absorbed by the small intestine and the large intestine um, small intestine the large intestine uh, the stomach all of that is going to be in this hepatic portal vein hepatic the liver but this liver still needs to eat it needs oxygen it needs glucose it needs energy it needs to make that energy the cells of the actual organ need to function so for the liver so you have the hepatic artery and the hepatic vein so if we look at the actual liver remember this is the portal vein so at the liver um, there's the liver you're going to have coming into the liver you're going to have the hepatic portal vein and you're going to have the hepatic vein exiting the liver okay and the hepatic portal vein coming in here and you're going to have the hepatic artery why because the hepatic portal vein is its job and the hepatic artery is bringing oxygen and nutrients to the actual tissue of the liver so that they can do their job so people you have to understand double circulation that we have pulmonary circulation and systemic circulation you've also got to understand that although and I know we get, we'll, we'll focus in on this just now closer but this little thing this heart is very important because if it's muscle tissue remember this is made of cardiac cells if this muscle tissue doesn't get oxygen and it doesn't get nutrients the cells here of the heart muscle will not have energy to work and the heart will stop working and then we die so the circulation that goes to all the parts of the body, the systemic circulation leaving via the aorta, there'll be a branch from that aorta which will be the, the, the coronary artery and that will supply the heart tissue itself with nutrients and oxygen. Clearly then the coronary vein is going to come out of the coronary vein and it's going to go into the venae caves so it can go back to the heart for normal circulation. Okay, so the human circulatory system, what I've done is I've included this in the X sheets for you because here the labels are very, very small, but this is basically what I've just explained to you now. So let's use pink and we're going to show you here. The heart, the blood comes um, from the lungs, okay? It's going to go into the heart. Now this is going to be oxygenated blood, all right? This oxygenated blood goes into the left side of the heart and it pumps via the aorta to all the parts. It goes to everything above the heart and everything below the heart, all right? So if it goes to, for example, the small and the large intestine, we call them mesentric. So it's the superior mesentric vein, uh, artery and the inferior mesentric artery. Okay, so mesentric would be your, your digestive system. If it goes to the stomach, we know if we get a runny tummy, it's called gastro. So anything to do with the stomach would be the gastric artery and the gastric vein. Okay, um, let me try and see what else I can look at here. We've got to the kidney, 
would be renal. It's anything to do with the kidney would be renal artery, renal vein. Going to the legs, um, the iliac artery and the iliac vein. Um, please remember though the hepatic portal vein which takes blood from the digestive system to the liver so the liver can do its job on all the different substances that have been absorbed. And then coming into the liver as well, we're going to have the hepatic artery. So we'll have two structures entering the liver. The one for the liver to do its job and the other one for the liver to eat. Like a baker or a butcher. Just because they work with meat all day doesn't mean that they get nutrients. They actually have to sit down and have breakfast or lunch or and lunch and supper. So the same here, hepatic portal vein, the liver works with that blood. Hepatic artery is bringing oxygenated nutrient blood to the liver so the liver tissue can work. All right, the same with the heart. The heart works with blood. That would be the inferior vena cava coming from the bottom of the body. The superior vena cava coming, bringing blood from the top of the body. All of this blood here is deoxygenated blood. And that will then enter the right side of the heart. And from there, it will then be pumped to the lungs. Why? We want to take the carbon dioxide out and put oxygen back in so we can circulate the blood systemically a second time around and a third time and a fourth time and that's all your heart does. It pumps blood to the lungs and then it pumps oxygenated blood to all the parts of the body. Um, but please make sure that you know your major veins and arteries. So to the stomach, gastric. To the liver, hepatic. All right, to the kidneys, renal. To the legs, iliac. To the arms, subclavian. Okay, it's the subclavian artery that goes in and the subclavian vein that comes out. That's that main vein that you'll see here um, on people that are actually quite thin. And if you're really well trained, um, you'll be able to see those main veins sticking out. You can only see veins. These things here are all veins. The arteries are inside. All right, so and then clearly to the brain. Here, what you can see, you know if somebody screams or shouts or they talk loud, and you'll see those veins sticking out, those are jugular veins. Those bring blood from the brain, okay? But you've got your carotid artery. So if you take your fingers, remember you never feel pulse with your thumb, always with your two fingers. In next to the trachea here, it's going, you're going to be able to feel a pulse. That, and we're going to talk later on about what a pulse is. But that there, these are your carotid arteries taking blood to the brain. Right, now we go on to the heart. All vessels that flow away from the heart are called arteries. So A for away and A for artery. Okay, it doesn't matter what they're carrying, okay, because your pulmonary artery is carrying deoxygenated blood and your aorta and all the other arteries are carrying oxygenated blood. So please don't say arteries carry oxygenated blood, veins carry deoxygenated blood. That's wrong, wrong, wrong. Artery if it flows away from the heart, vein if it flows to the heart, okay? If it enters the heart, it's called a vein, okay? The term artery and vein are not determined by what the vessel transports, and we've gone through that a number of times now. So here is our heart, and please, people, make sure that you learn the diagram. It's in your X notes. You'll be able to see, and if you don't have your X notes, go on to uh, Mindset's website, onto the Learn Extra website, and you will find the, the X sheets and have a look at those diagrams. Learn it. All right, so what we've got with regards to the heart is what's in red here is going to be carrying oxygenated blood, and the parts in blue is deoxygenated blood. Okay, this cross through an oxygen is my abbreviation. It's, too, it's much better than writing out deoxygenated. All right, now, if it's red, we've got our pulmonary veins. Remember, why are they veins? Because they're entering the heart. And they will always enter the left side of the heart. Easiest way to remember it is the right side is when you are looking at a, a, a structure like we have on the overhead here. 
the right side is the opposite to your right side and the left side is the opposite to your left side. It's as if you are looking at a person lying in front of you. Or if I took a heart and I stuck it on the table here, that would be the right side and that would be the left side. So the right side is always deoxygenated blood. Deoxygenated blood. So the right side of the heart will always work with deoxygenated blood. Always. And that's why we shade it in blue. Now for me, I always remember the blue on the right because for me, I like blue. Blue is my favorite color and I would choose blue over red any day of the week. So for me, it's easy. I'm right-handed and I like blue, so blue is right. And what you are left with is if you look at the left side, the left side is going to be oxygenated blood and it is red. Now if you look at oxygenated blood, um, you know in movies when people are bleeding and it looks like they've chucked tomato sauce on them, that actually is the color of oxygenated blood. It's bright. It's very bright. And if you were ever to follow a, um, a career in, um, for example, emergency services, or you decided to even go and do something as simple as a first aid, um, you know, level one or two or three first aid course, they would teach you that how do you tell if a person is bleeding from an artery or a vein if they cut? Well, from an artery, it would be bright red blood and the blood will pump. It'll actually come out, shh, shh, then you know, oops, we have a problem. Um, if it is a vein, now a lot of people have given blood, um, whether it's, it's to test your blood because you've got something wrong with you and the doctors don't know, but most people at some stage of their lives, especially at your age, has given blood or they have had blood taken. Um, and that blood is always dark, it's like a dark purple color. So we call that blue blood versus red blood. All right, so right side is always deoxygenated and you will always look at it as blue. And the, red si the, the left side is red because it is oxygenated. It's bright red because of the hemoglobin. Okay, you must know all the structures here. So the easiest way to look at the heart is like this. Draw this for yourself. And you say, right, I have like a skull. You know those, those alien type skulls? Mm. This is what we've got. There we go. There's my heart. Okay, so coming in. Now remember I don't have blue so I'm going to use green. Okay, coming in from the bottom part of the body is the inferior vena cava, main vein. Okay, bringing deoxygenated blood. From above, you have the superior vena cavae. Okay, that's bringing blood into the heart. And remember, into the right side, it's deoxygenated, no oxygen. Now that blood has to go into the ventricles because these little round things here are called the, it's an atrium. And remember, A starts a is before V, and this is the ventricle. So if we look at the vent ventricle, sorry, ventricle. So if we look here, we've got, it's in a V shape. So there's the ventricle, and there's the atrium. So if we look back at our diagram here, look, there's the atrium, and there is the ventricle. See? So we've got two ventricles, two atrium. So the blood will come into the atrium, and then get squeezed into the ventricles and from the ventricles it's going to go psh, out to all the parts of the body. This side's going to go to all the parts of the body, this side is going to take it to the lungs and so we carry on. Also if you look at the heart, it's divided in the center here and that center division is the same as the center division that you have between your two nostrils. This is called a septum and the same with the heart, it's called a septum, so it's easy to remember. The actual muscle around the heart is called myocardium, but what we've got is the left side of the heart will always be, have thicker muscle 
than the right side of the heart. Now, I need for you to think why, and I'm going to tell you just now, but in the meantime, I want you to think that the left side of the heart will always have a stronger muscular wall and a thicker muscular wall than the right side. Why is that? Okay, moving along, I want you to have a look at our heart. So what I've got, there's your, what, what the heart will look like. Remember, the aorta comes out on the left, and this is a little bit smaller than what your real heart is. Okay, it's not a huge thing. If you make a fist, that is the size of your heart. Now, if you put your arm straight against your side, and you twist your hand a little bit, and you put your hand in this, this here is where your heart is. That's why whenever people make an oath or swear allegiance to something, they put their hand over the left side. Right hand over your left side because this is where your heart. So you're literally swearing on your heart. Okay, so here's our heart. So we're now going to take it apart. And I'm going to move the musculus area. Okay, this is what we have here. So if you look at this, you're going to have, remember, as I'm holding this heart to you now, this is the left side, this is the right side. So the left side will have the aorta pumping to all the parts of the body. And what we can see here, as um, the way the structure is here, you've got the Vena, inferior vena cava coming in here, and you've got the superior vena cava coming in there. Now, looking here, there's the septum, all right? Those are the atria, where I've got my fingers now. Those are the atria. And then you've got your ventricles are always in a V shape. Now, if you see these white things that are over here, those are valves. And on the right side, we have a tricuspid and on the left, a bicuspid or mitral valve. So the left one, you can either call a mitral valve or a bicuspid, two. And on the, on the right side, you have a tricuspid or it's, it's, it just, it's got three parts to it. It's a tricuspid valve, okay? So the blood goes from the atria into the ventricles and from the ventricles, it's going to now be pushed out through the aorta and out through the pulmonary artery that's going to take blood to the lungs. Remember, if it exits the heart, if it moves away from the heart, it's an artery. If it moves to, into the heart, it's a vein. It doesn't matter whether it's carrying oxygen, oxygenated blood or deoxygenated blood. Okay, so there's our little structure. So let's have a look. Okay, so that blood is moving away. It's moving towards the left lung and the right lung. So in other words, if it's moving away from the heart, it is going to be an artery. But it's going to where? It's going to the lung. So therefore, it's going to be the come artery. If it's going to the lung, it's going to be the pulmonary artery. All right? If it's on this side, we're going to have the pulmonary artery artery and that's taking blood to the right and the left lung and this one coming in here let's get our different let's make it pink the one coming in is going to be the pulmonary vein and the pulmonary vein is carrying oxygenated blood where the pulmonary artery is carrying deoxygenated blood. All right, now, that blood from the, from the pulmonary veins, are going to, that blood's going to flow in here, and it comes into the atrium. Then it goes into the ventricle. And remember, this is... The left side, the, the right side, that's the left side. Now the blood's going to go from here. It's going to go up into the aorta and then to all the parts of the body for circulation. 
Blood's going to come back, inferior venae cavae, superior venae cavae, into the atrium, into the ventricle, and then out through the pulmonary the, uh, um, arteries because it's leaving the heart. And that is how circulation takes place. All right, now people, we're going to look at the cardiac cycle. Okay, go back to our little diagram here. We've got the atria which are at the top of the heart, and the ventricles are at the bottom. Remember, A comes before V, but also the ventricles are shaped in a V shape. The reason, and I told you to think about it, why the left side of the heart muscle is, the wall is thicker than the right side, is because the left side has to pump blood up through the aorta to all the parts of the body. In other words, it's got to pump blood to your brain and it's got to pump blood to your toes. Okay, our toes are downhill, that's easy. But pump blood to the brain, okay? So the left side must have a lot of muscle because it's got to work hard to pump blood to all the parts of the body through circulation. All right, so part of the circulatory system. Whereas the right side of the heart, where does that have to send blood? simply got to send the blood to the lungs. So by sending it just to the lungs, it's not a heck of a long distance because, hello, your heart sits here, your lungs sit here. They're right on top of your heart. In fact, the, your heart is sort of snuggled inside and sort of into the left, uh, the, the left lung. So it's there, not a long distance. So the right side of the heart doesn't have to have a lot of muscle tissue, but the left side, does because we're going to pump this blood all over the show. Now, if we look here, you've got the blood is to come into the atria, the blood then goes into the ventricles, and the blood then goes out through the capillary artery, uh, I mean the, the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So that's, it's, it's like four steps. But I want you to think about this. If I told you to fill a balloon at a tap, Okay, and there you are, you've got this balloon and you're filling it up with water at the tap. Now somebody comes and they squeeze that balloon. Will you be able to put a lot of water into the balloon? Definitely not. Because as that person, as you turn the tap on harder, that, that person's going to squeeze to make sure that that water goes nowhere. It can't fill the balloon. But if I let go of the pressure here, the balloon will fill up nicely. Now it's the same in the heart. The blood first goes into the atria, and then it goes into the ventricles, and then it goes out. So that's your step. Atria, ventricles, out. The top side part of the heart works together, and the bottom side works together. So you've got the left and the right sides at the top, and the left and the right sides at the bottom. So top two, bottom two, out. And that's the way the heart works. So. The top half works as one unit. The bottom half works as one unit. Remember, the top half are going to be your a, um, atria, or one atrium, left atrium and right atrium. So your two atria. And the bottom is the ventricles. So you've got two atria and you've got two ventricles. Now, the sinoatrial node, sino means structure. It's a little sinus, a little cavity. So sinoatrial, it sits in the atria, which is the top part. It's this part of the heart in the atria. Okay, so the sinoatrial node, it's a node that sits on in the left sinoatrium, regulates and starts the whole process. That's what causes your heartbeat. And your pulse rate, it's your pacemaker. And it's called, its proper name is the sinoatrial node. You must know this. Okay, now, to understand the cardiac cycle, you need to know the following. First of all, one heartbeat takes approximately 0.8 seconds. And this, you must know. This is in a normal person um, just standing or sitting um, not being active, just having a nice relaxed time, okay? You sitting watching me at the moment, 
you should, your heartbeat should be approximately 0.8 seconds. Okay. A normal heartbeat, we have a rate of approximately 72 to 75 beats per minute. Now, what you can do um, is the slower your heartbeat, the fitter you are. The higher your heartbeat, just sitting where you are now, the less fit you are. So if you have a heartbeat that's more than 75 beats per minute, I strongly suggest you start walking around the block every day to get fitter because you are then a couch potato, people. So 75 is quite a high heartbeat rate. So just normal. Take two fingers, never your thumb because you've got a pulse in your thumb. Take your two fingers and find the brachial artery, which is down here. Okay, in between your tendons and you'll be able to feel a pulse. And if you battle to feel a pulse there, then go in here. You'll feel your trachea here. Okay, go in next to your trachea and you'll get your carotid artery. And then just hold your fingers there and take a watch and time yourself. So you only have to listen for like 15 seconds, but count the beats in 15 seconds and you times that by four. Or if you really want to sit there for a whole minute, then sit and wait and count all the beats in one minute. Okay, it should be between 72 and 75. If it is less than 72, then you are fit. Well, it means you're fitter and fitter and fitter. And if it is more, then you are very unfit. Okay, now, the contraction of the heart muscle is called the systole. And think of S for systole and S for stressed. Now, this is proper biological terminology. We don't say, hmm, the heart contract, this, these muscles contract and these muscles relax. I'm going to teach it to you because I want you to understand what's happening. But in an exam, instead of saying the word contract, you must write systole. And instead of relax, when the heart muscle relaxes, we call it diastole. Okay, now some teachers pr pronounce it diastole and systole. I'm glad for them. I just want you to be able to spell it. So diastole and systole. Now another way to remember is if you die, when something's dead, it's relaxed. It's completely relaxed. Okay, it's just like bleh. So die for diastole, relaxed. Stressed for systole because that is when it contracts, it pushes the blood through. So systole, contract, diastole, relax. And if you remember those two, you cannot confuse it. All right. We start off with atrial systole. Okay, so here the atria are going to contract. So the first thing that happens is, now let's forget about the words. Let's look at this. You've got this heart. Here, here is our little heart. Okay. The atria have to relax so that blood fills in here. So the atria is just sitting there. Okay. And they fill with blood. As they fill with blood and they get heavier, there's going to be a little bit of pressure, but not a lot. Okay. But they are in diastole. So atrial diastole, they relax. Now, step one is going to be, those atria are full of blood. So what are they going to do? They're going to contract. And when they contract, we're going to have atrial systole. And that's going to squeeze the blood into the ventricles. So now the blood's sitting in the ventricles. Okay, that was easy. And the blood goes into the ventricles. Now, between the atria and the ventricles, we have the valves. Okay, and those valves have a whole bunch of cords next to them, and we call those the chordae, cords, tendinae. They're made of tendons, so they're tendinous cords. So the Latin for it is chordae, tendinae. So we've got the chordae, tendinae between the valves. So the blood goes from here, the atria contract, and they squeeze the blood through the valves into the ventricles. Now the ventricles are going to fill up, and as those ventricles are filling up, so there's going to be a bit of pressure, okay? Imagine your hand, and if I take a balloon and I'm filling the balloon with water, it's going to get heavier and heavier. So there's going to be some pressure on your hand, okay? Then I've now got to get the blood from those ventricles out. 
So what happens is the ventricles contract. But when they contract, those valves that the blood flowed through close because they only allow blood to flow in one direction. So let's just go... Um, so what we have is this. This is your atrial diastole. Okay? In other words, the atrial is going to relax. The atria on both sides. So they relax and the blood flows in. The blood coming in from the, the superior, uh, superior and inferior vena caves and you've got the blood coming in, oxygenated blood coming in from the lungs. All right? Now, the blood goes in the atria and the atria are relaxed and the ventricles are relaxed and we have our semilunar valves sitting closed because blood is flowing back into the heart from the aorta and from the... So that's, everything's just parking off now. Atria full up. Then we have atrial systole. Now remember the atria are going to contract and they're going to push the blood into the ventricles but we've got the chordae tendine here between those two valves now remember the tricuspid is on the right side the bicuspid is on the left side okay and the blood is now going to be pushed into the ventricles the ventricles must be relaxed because if they're not relaxed they're not going to allow that blood to go in there okay so they have to be completely relaxed when the atria contract now Okay, we're going to have to stop sorry, for a sec here. Raised. So I didn't, I, sorry, I thought I had erased everything. Sorry, sorry. Okay, cool. And we can just start from there on the screen. And in your time. Okay, now, if we look at the ventricular systole, remember the ventricles are contracting. Systole stress. Okay, now... They're going to fill with the blood because they're completely relaxed. They fill up. Okay. There's a pressure that increases. If you can imagine, if I take a, 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 a we go back to the balloon, filling it up with water, and I, you put your hand underneath. As that balloon fills up with water, so there's going to be pressure on you. Okay. Pressure in your hand. All right. Now, this is what's happening. And then the ventricles contract. And boy, when they contract, they push that blood with, a, with an, a purpose. Because remember, the blood that's going to the lungs, not an issue. But the blood going to the, the, the rest of the body, out to the aorta, that blood has to have a huge push to it. All right, because it's got to go to all the parts of the body. So this one, pushing that blood all the way up into the aorta is going to be, it's going to be like a fist smack. All right, so the ventricles contract, and this contraction lasts 0.3 seconds. So the, the atrial contraction, all right, when the atria contract lasts 0.1 seconds. It's just pshht. Now... Those ventricles, when they contract, it's 0.3 seconds. They, they contract with a vengeance. They push that blood all the way out the aorta. Okay, pulmonary artery is not an issue, but it's, it's the aorta that's a big one. Okay, the contraction forces the blood upwards, and this is going to cause your bicuspid and your tricuspid valves to close, and that makes a loud noise. You can't say that your heartbeat is doof, 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 doof. How do you write doof, doof on your paper? We call it the lub is the loud sound, dub is the soft sound. So your heartbeat is loud sound, soft sound. Loud sound, soft sound. That loud sound we write as lub, L-U-B-B, -B, and that is when the pressure from the ventricles pushes the blood back up against the, the, the bicuspid and tricuspid valves, and the valves go, oops, and they close. Because remember, those cords prevent it from, close, from going this way, because otherwise your blood will just spurt out of the heart again. So you want the blood to only ever flow in one direction. So... What happens? The blood goes through the valve from the atria into the ventricles and we get those valves go whop and they close. That's the love sound. It's because of pressure from the ventricles. It's loud, it's potent, it's strong and that's what gives you your good strong heartbeat. Love sound. Oops. Okay. That's your love sound. The blood can only pass through the pulmonary artery now which goes to the, to the lungs or the aorta, which takes the blood to the rest of circulation.
And remember, the atria have to be relaxed because if you look at this here, if the atria aren't relaxed, when the ventricles contract, uh, hello, those valves are not going to close because and, and there's going to be it's going to be a mess. They must be relaxed so the valves can close up against them. Okay. Now, third part, ventricular systole. The ventricles contract. Okay. And we push that blood to all the parts. So your atria here are relaxed. Okay, completely relaxed. Hang on, relaxed. Completely relaxed. Your bicuspid and your tricuspid valves are closed because this blood is pushed up against the valve. So the valves have closed. And that closing of the valves here is your lub sound. Okay, and you've got your semilunar valves are now open. And those are the valves that go into the aorta and into the pulmonary artery. And the pulmonary artery is going to go to the lungs and the aorta is going to go to all the parts of the body. Also, please people, that's the right side and that's the left side of the heart. So your left ventricle is going to have a very thick wall here because it's going to push the blood up through the aorta to all the parts of the body. All right, and if we look here, now the blood has gone in here. Our deoxygenated blood is going to go up through the semi lunar valves. And we have a semi lunar valve here in the pulmonary artery. And we have a semilunar valve here into the aorta. Okay, so the blood here is going to go, the, the, the tricuspid and the bicuspid valves close as the ventricles contract, and the blood will now go up through the aorta and up into the pulmonary arteries. And that big bang there, the force to close the, the tricuspid and bicuspid valves, that is going to be your lub sound. It's as those valves go whoops, and they close. Okay, then we have phase three, which is general diastole. Now remember 0 0.8 for a heartbeat. 0 0.1 was the atrial systole. Then we have 0 0.3 seconds for the ventricular systole. Now we have general diastole. In other words, the whole heart just relaxes. So for 50% of the time, the heart is relaxed. And for 50% of the time, the atria and the ventricles are contracting. Okay, so the ventricles relax, there's less pressure because the blood has been pushed out now. Okay, to prevent the blood from flowing backwards, the ventricles have semilunar valves. Okay, and that will only be in the aorta and the pulmonary artery, just like I've shown you here. Okay, they're the semilunar valves in the pulmonary artery and in the aorta. Now remember, when the ventricles start to relax, there's no more pressure pushing that blood out via um, the pulmonary artery and, and the aorta. Okay, so what happens now? The blood will start flowing backwards. And to stop that blood from flowing back into the ventricles, we have these semilunar valves. Okay, so the atria are relaxed. There's a general state of diastole and it lasts for 0.4 seconds. And then it gets ready for the next cycle to begin. Now people, you must know what the stroke volume is. It's the amount of blood that is pumped through the heart during each cardiac cycle. So from the time the blood goes into the atria, into the ventricles, and out to the pulmonary artery and the aorta. That is one stroke. All right, so stroke volume will be the amount of blood that is pumped through the heart with each cardiac cycle. Now, when we exercise, our stroke volume increases. So we are able to pump more blood with each time the heart pumps. Because remember, with exercise, especially cardio type exercise, your heart learns to work harder. So you're also exercising not just your legs and your arms and your 
gluteus maximus and all the different parts of your body, but you are also exercising your heart muscle. So the heart starts to work more efficiently. So with each pump, it will pump more blood out, so the stroke volume will increase as you get fitter. Okay? Um, so therefore, you can pump more oxygen and glucose to all the parts of the body. So people, the fitter you are, the greater your stroke volume becomes, and you need to know that. All right, here's the general diastole. The whole heart just relaxes. Everything relaxes, so the blood flows back from the pulmonary artery, blood flows back from the aorta, and that closes the semilunar valves, okay? And when it closes those semilunar valves, all right, because the atria and the ventricles are both relaxed, that gives you your dub sound. And that's the soft sound. So if you remember, the lub sound is because the ventricles have contracted and the blood closes the, the, the um, tricuspid and bicuspid valves. It's a whack. And then the blood goes out to the aorta and the, and the um, pulmonary artery. But when the ventricles relax, well, there's no more blood being squished out. So what happens? That blood slows down and slows down as there's no pressure, and then the blood starts to flow back. We don't want backflow. So the semilunar valves will close, because the semilunar valves face one direction. So they face like that. When the blood's flowing through them, they open, and as the blood stops flowing through, they close. So it does chips, and it closes, and it's a soft sound, because it's a lack of pressure that causes the semilunar valves in the pulmonary artery and the... And, and the um, aorta to close. It's a lack of pressure. And because it's a lack of pressure, it is a very soft sound. It's the dub sound. All right, now heartbeat. When you listen to the heartbeat, there are two distinct sounds. We've discussed the lub and the dub. The lub is loud, the dub is soft. The lub sound is when the atrioventricular valves now, atrio, between the atria and the ventricle. Atrioventricular valves, atria, ventricle, between the two, okay? And on the right, we are going to have the tricuspid. And on the left, we have the bicuspid valves. They are my atrioventricular valves. So that's their group. What are their specific names? On the right, on the right, your right. On the right, we are going to have the tricuspid, and on the left, we're going to have the bicuspid. Okay, the dub sound is when the semilunar valves close, okay, and they're all to, to prevent any backflow. We don't want backflow of the blood into the ventricles, all right? A doctor listens to the heart with an instrument called a stethoscope. People, you must know what a stethoscope is. But even in, in your soap operas, if anybody's in a hospital and anybody's supposed to be a doctor, they have the stethoscope around their necks because that's supposed to make them a doctor. Okay, but the stethoscope's the thing that you put into your ears and you can listen to the person's heart and their lungs and their chest, etc. A person's pulse is felt when pressing the fingers, not the thumb, here into the brachial arteries right here and you can feel your pulse um, and if your pulse is weak there you can always feel a nice strong pulse here at the carotid arteries okay so and it's caused as a result of the pressure of the blood as it's being forced through the aorta that's what your beat is now you'll recognize this because also in your soapies um, and tv programs you'll see There'll be this big monitor next to the person lying there and they're half dead or they're in a coma and it goes, jidit, 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 and that's the heartbeat. Now, it's called an ECG or an electrocardio, means heart, gram, ECG. So it's abbreviated to an ECG reading and this is in thousands of seconds and this is atrial excitation, so the atria are going to contract. Then you have the ventricular excitation, so that's when the ventri ventricle contracts. It's not going to contract if it isn't excited. And remember, it's electro. It's, it's the electrodes that actually cause your heart to contract. So first the atria contracts, then the ventricles contract, and then you have the ventricle and the atria all relaxing. And they repolarize, and then we start the whole process again. So what I found on the internet 
was this. And this is how we get that blips reading that we have when we watch TV. There is your sinoatrial node. Okay, remember that this is the right side of the heart and that is the left side of the heart. And that's where your sinoatrial node sits. It's in the atrium, the right atrium. Now watch here, and I'm going to do it quickly. So we're going to go. This is the impulse that goes through. And it spreads, and it spreads, and it spreads. Now the blood's going into the ventricles. And you see how this flaps close here? Let's just go back. Here the blood's going from the atria into the ventricles. Okay, so the blood's now pushing out. Your atria are contracting. So therefore it is atrial systole. They're contracting. Blood gets pushed in. Okay, now this stimulus there causes the ventricles to start contracting. See, Ventric ventricular excitation is over there. So now the ventricles start to contract. And as those ventricles contract, the blood is now forced upwards. And if these valves close, the blood can go nowhere but out that way and out that way. So via the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Okay? And there they're still contracting. And they contract even more. Look at how they push. And also notice here, remember the right side, the left side. Look at the size of the muscle tissue here. And look at the size of the muscle tissue here. It's much wider here and less there. Why? This side has to push to all the parts of the body because there is the A or T. Okay? And then we go. And now the ventricles and everything start to relax. And, sorry, hold on, let's go to here. The ventricles start to relax, so the blood starts to flow back. And those semi-lunar valves in the aorta and the pulmonary artery are going to, uh, uh, sorry, are going to close. And that's going to give you your dub sound. Okay. And there we have it. This here is a whole bunch of graphs, and they can be very confusing. But what they do is they show you your electrocardiogram, all right, and how that works in relation to the ventric ventricular volume, in other words, the, the volume of blood that's in the ventricle, versus the ventricular uh, um, process here and the way the ventricle works, so it's ventri the ventricle's pressure. And then you have the aorta's pressure, which is actually very important because you're going to have the blood, the, the, the aortic valve opens at this point because this is where your ventricle is going to contract. As the pressure in the ventricle increases, because all of this is pressure, as the pressure in the ventricle increases, so the pressure in the aorta is going to increase. People, if I put my hand like this around the tap and I turn the tap on full blast, the pressure of that water going through the tap is going to have an impact on my hand. You follow? Now remember, the aorta is just sitting there and this blood's flowing through the aorta. So the greater the pressure in the ventricle, the greater the pressure of the blood going through the aorta. Right, so that, and then clearly the, the pressure in the ventricle is going to decrease because it's finished contracting now, so the pressure in the aorta will decrease, okay? But now, so there's no more blood for forcing through the aorta, but when the ventricle contracts, there's no more pushing up of the blood, so the blood now starts to almost want to come back because there's nothing causing it to go up anymore. And as it flows back, Oops, it closes the semilunar valves. And that will create just a little bubble of pressure there as the blood builds up around the semilunar valve. And then we have complete diastole again. And then systole and diastole.
And that's all I wanted to really show you here. If I was examining you, I'd give you what was in the blue and the aorta, and I'd ask you why that happened. So just remember, whatever the pressure from the ventricle is, it's going to have a full impact on the aorta. Lots of pressure from the ventricle, that blood's going to be flowing fast to the aorta. No more pressure on the ventricle, the blood is now going to start to want to flow back, and the semilunar valve will then stop it from doing it. Okay, regulation of the heartbeat. Heart and lungs functioning, uh, uh, functioning is regulated by the medulla oblongata. Okay, that's in the brain. Now, the medulla will, will always regulate heartbeat and breathing rate because the minute you start to exercise and you need more oxygen, the faster your heart will beat. So your breathing rate and your heartbeat rate are always linked. Okay, nerve impulses from the medulla will go to the sinoatrial node, that's the pacemaker, and it will make sure that the pacemaker controls the systole and the diastole of the cardiac cells so that the whole beating rate of the heart is increased. So if we have an increase in carbon dioxide, okay, it stimulates chemochemical receptors in the aortic arch and the carotid arteries, okay, Aortic arch, <clears throat> the aorta as it comes out, and the carotid arteries, well, you can feel them here. That's what you check your heartbeat with. All right? Um, the medulla oblongata then sends impulses to stimulate the sinoatrial node, and it will then cause the heart to beat faster. The medulla oblongata will also stimulate the rate at which oxygen is inhaled because it affects the lungs. So heartbeat automatically increases your breathing rate. The two go hand in hand. It doesn't help people breathing faster because you've got too much carbon dioxide in your blood, okay, and you want to get more oxygen in, um, and the heart's not pumping faster to pump that blood to all the parts of the body. Okay, and it doesn't help the heart pumping, and the lungs aren't working and getting in the extra oxygen. So they must work together, hand in glove. The medulla oblongata is regulated by the hypothalamus, and the autonomic, it works automatically, autonomic nervous system. Okay, you don't have to think about it. Now let's do our question here. The following diagram shows the heart doing the cardiac cycle. The arrows represent the flow of blood. Now study the diagrams and answer the questions that follow. So here we have diagram one. So what's happening here? The atria are relaxed. So here we have atrial diastole. Okay, here the atria are contracting, so atrial systole, and here the ventricles are pushing the blood, so that will be ventricular systole. Okay, now it says identify the structures labeled A and B respectively. So A is your semilunar valves, and B is your, A is the semilunar valves between the aorta and the pulmonary artery, and B is going to be the... Okay, so that's the right side, this is the left side, right side, left side, and do what I'm doing in an exam, please people, so you don't mess it up. They're not pointing to the right valve, okay, tricuspid, they're pointing to the left valve, which is the bicuspid valve. So we're going to say A is the semi-lunar valve. And B is the bicuspid valve. Easy two marks. Okay, now I'm going to explain what happens in each phase of the cardiac cycle represented by diagram 1, diagram 2, and diagram 3. And I'm not going to write this out, I'm just going to explain it to you now. So what happens here, we have diagram 1 is atrial diastole. So the atria are relaxed, okay. And as they are relaxed, blood is coming in from the uh, inferior and superior venae caves into the right side of the lung and into the, in the right side of the lung and into the left side of the lung. We're going to have blood coming in from the pulmonary vein. Atria must be relaxed, all right, so that they can fill with blood, so atrial diastole. All right, in diagram two, the atrial systole takes place, so the atria contract, and as they contract, blood is forced from the atria into the ventricles through the tricuspid valve on the right 
and the bicuspid bulb on the left. And the blood then goes into the ventricles while we have ventricular so a di a diastole. So here we have ventricular diastole when the atria contract, because the ventricles, remember, must be relaxed. Then for three, if we look at our diagram here, the ventricles contract, so we have ventricular systole. The blood is forced upwards and it causes the tricuspid and the bicuspid valves, which are atrioventricular valves, to close. And the pressure to close them creates the lub sound and it prevents blood from going back into the atria. Blood is instead pushed up into the, uh, the, the pulmonary artery and into the aorta. All right, and that's that. It's exactly as we've just gone through it. All right, question 1.3. Loss of blood, a lot of blood, vomiting and diarrhea often causes a decrease in blood volume. Okay, as a result, blood cannot move around the body uh, um, um, sorry, move normally around the body as blood vessels are not completely full. Um, the tissue do not get enough blood, leading to possible death of cells and hence damage to the cells. Now, we need to explain. Explain why severe vomiting and diarrhea would cause a decrease in the blood volume. Well, there'd be less water because you're losing that water by vomiting and because of diarrhea. Okay, so uh, less water in the blood and therefore you would have less volume in your blood. Right, and when you have less volume, the, the blood can't move around properly. All right, so that's your two marks there. Just there'd be loss of water because of the vomiting and the diarrhea. You lose a lot of water and lack of water me would mean lack of volume of blood. Okay. If you look at question B, um, what is the relationship between blood volume and blood pressure? Now remember, what they want you to do here is they want you to explain that blood, <coughs> sorry, blood volume um, affects blood pressure. Okay, so if there is greater blood volume, it will result in increased pressure. So, if for example, if you have low blood pressure, your doctor will prescribe tablets for you that will cause you to keep water in your body. If you keep water in your body, the volume of your blood will increase and it will lift your pressure up. If you have very high blood pressure, then your body will, your doctor will give you a diuretic, which will cause you to lose water and thereby dilute the amount of water in your blood. Same as um, if you have low blood pressure, people will tell you to eat lots more salt. Why? Because salt keeps water in your body. And if you have high blood pressure, they say salt and sodium are a no-no. You mustn't eat sodium or, or, or um, salt, which is uh, um, sodium chloride. You mustn't eat it. Why? Because it's going to make you sick. It's going to make you retain water, and then you are going to end up with huge blood pressure issues. All right. So there you go. That's it for part one. So until we get together and do part two, have an awesome day. Bye. <laughs> Let's <laughs> go.